Can we pray together? So Father, in our own small way and empowered by your Holy Spirit and standing on the foundation of your word, we do our best to see your son, Jesus Christ, crucified for us. It's too big for any of us to take in, but as the church of Jesus Christ, we do what we're called to do, to take in the depth and the breadth and the height of the love of God in Jesus Christ as it found its fullest expression in his life poured out for us on the cross. Lord, we're appalled by the evil we see mirrored in the cross. We look at Jesus, a perfect gift. We're appalled by what we've done as a people, but we are filled with hope knowing that he did it willingly. And that's why we've come together tonight, Lord. So we pray that you'd keep giving us that measure of your Holy Spirit so that we won't leave here the same. Deepen our gratitude for you and so deepen our obedience and so deepen our dependence upon you so that our hope will be indestructible and our witness powerful. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Separation is a powerful word, to be separated. It's not a word we use a lot. It's a word that we reserve for certain situations. Like when I was, got lost at the St. Louis Zoo as a little boy and was pretty much convinced that I was starting my life, new life as an orphan. <laughs> and when adults came up to me and said, have you been separated from your parents? When they were using big words like that, I knew I was in trouble. And I thought, yeah, that's right, I have been separated from my parents. Or maybe many in the room know the gut-clenching pain that comes when you hear that your parents are separated from one another. A marriage that we had so much hope for and now there's so much hurt and selfishness has come between two people that what God has joined together has been separated. And it seems right to use a big word like that. Separation, I've been really meditating on a lot in these past two years of political upheaval in our country and quarantines and COVID and the death of so many loved ones. That I've started to really notice in the scripture and in my own life that sin is in the separation business. Sin separates us. Sin, first of all, separates us from other people. Only because we've had a long time to get used to it could we ever fail to be horrified by the fact that some parents hate and do not talk to their own children. Some children come and grow to hate and just purposely stay away from their own parents. To think that a child is born, the only way that they come into this world is joined to a family, and to think that sin, the way we treat one another, could enter even into that situation and separate those people from each other with unforgiveness and hatred is appalling. And when we think about the fact that sin separates neighbors from neighbors, that even though we live within a stone's throw of one another, that though we're de literally depending on each other for our survival, that if we don't stop separating from one another, we're not gonna make it as a people, and yet we don't stop. We do it more now than we ever have before. When I think about how much we allow sin to separate ourselves from each other in this country, I just think, how will we ever overcome it? How are we ever gonna close the gap? When I think about what I've done and I think about what our culture has done to this world that we're raising our children in, how will we explain to the generations that come after us what we've done? How will we build them a bridge across such a huge separation? How will we ever explain why we treat each other the way we do? There's only one word for it, it's sin. 
And it's so much more personal than just that it separates us from one another. It has even more power than that. I think there might be many in this room who understand sin's power to even separate us from ourselves. How many of us started off life with so many good plans and so much optimism and so many things we wanted to see? Who of us didn't watch movies as a child or read cool books and saw ourselves as the heroes wanted to be a good person, wanted to save our friends or our family, wanted to do something cool, and then time after time, it falls short even of our own standards until one day we wake up and look in the mirror and wonder, who is that person looking back at me? What have I become? What have I done and how can it ever be undone? And sin, maybe especially, separates us even from God. I think a lot of us come to understand that what we do is wrong and we can kind of feel that this universe must have a moral center to it because we find ourselves lost in our own selfishness, doing what we can and what we think is right, even if it hurts other people. We can sense in a deep way that whoever made this world certainly cannot countenance the type of behavior that we've done. There's no way he could be okay with it. And then when we think about the fact that he's the one who gave us these hands that we use to hurt the other people that he put with us that are made in his own image. We have done this. He supplied me with the air that I've used to abuse my brothers and my friends. We know that God, if he's the sort of God that can make a universe, surely he must see everything. There's nothing that could be hidden from him. How could it? Which means that he's there. He has seen it all. He knows who we are, all of us, and there's no hiding anything from him. And so how could we ever be together with him again? How could we ever overcome this infinite separation from the one in whose image we've made and without whom we will never find ourselves and never be at peace and never find joy? What are we going to do? How can we get out of it? How will we ever get around it? How could we ever pay for it? It's at times like this when we need to really look at the cross too often we look at half of it. I'll speak for myself, but maybe I have some friends here and I look at the cross and say, somehow because of this, I'm not gonna have to pay for what I've done. Which is right, it's true. God has forgiven us, his blood is good enough, it's paid the price and it's true. But that still feels like a transaction somehow, like this God has paid my price so maybe when I see him one day after all this horrible stuff is over, then maybe it'll be okay somehow. But what if it's a lot deeper than that? What if the cross has something to do with this separation that we experience between all of us and between ourselves and between us and God? Well, how could it, Josiah? I mean, as you said, it separates us from our neighbors and friends. It causes us to kill and take advantage and torture one another. It separates us from our own selves and it separates us from God. How could it? How are we gonna get through all of this? I remember when I was a young boy and I was swimming, a little too young to be in the deep end of the pool. Especially when you're an apartment kid and you see a pool like twice a year at the Motel 6 in the summer. And as I was going down for what I felt like the last time, I was swallowing water, couldn't catch my breath, couldn't find the floor, couldn't find the walls, I thought this might be it. And I remember coming through that panic and that haze, I saw an adult hand in front of me down in the water reaching for me, reaching for me. And in that helpless state, I remember thinking, what is that doing there? What's that hand doing there? All I saw before was an unbreakable barrier between me and safety, and now I see a hand reaching out to me. I didn't expect that. And I remember when I was in total despair over my life and I was sitting out on the Del Mar Loop on the sidewalk drinking my life away because I didn't know what else to do with this separation in my life. 
a group of people walking up to me with tracks that said Jesus loves me and even having the boldness to sit down at my table and begin to tell me there was hope for my life. And I thought, what are you doing here? This isn't for people like you. This is where we go. This is life support for those of us who don't know what else to do. What are you doing here? And I remember when overwhelmed and ready to just end my life from an addiction to methamphetamine and hopelessness and hating myself and hating everyone else I knew in my life, I remember walking outside to this God-forsaken apartment complex in Arnold and sitting down on a boulder and just looking up at what I thought at first was an empty sky and telling who knows who, I don't want to be the person I am anymore. And then all of a sudden, in an almost tangible way, the presence of the one who had always been there for me, the creator of the universe, the one who put his son on a cross for me, the one who made sure it was written in scripture, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was standing right there where he'd been the whole time, only now because I opened my mouth and asked for help, he helped me see that I had never been any further than him, than my breath is from me. And I remember thinking in my heart and in my head, what are you doing here? <laughs> you live here, you come here, you talk to people like me, what are you doing here? And I think as Christians, too often we don't look at the cross and see, yes, what we have done. This is how we've treated the Son of God. This is how we've treated the perfect gift that was given to us. But I don't think often enough we don't look at the cross and say, what are you doing here? Because God isn't found past our sin. God isn't found after our sin. God isn't found under it, around it, or before it. Unbelievably, and only to be found in the cross, only to be found in the God we hear about in the Bible, only to be found in Jesus Christ, is it to be believed that God has had the humility, the love, the grace to be found in it with us. What's he doing here? Why would he be here? What have we done for him? We did it to him. We did it to each other. What in the world is he doing here? And every time I get the opportunity to go and speak in a prison and I look around at the love of God and these hardened men's faces changing their lives and putting them back together, I'm blown away again by the cross that says, Jesus is here. He's in prison with these guys. He lives here. He's here with them. And I wonder, what in the world is he doing here? And every time I've been down to the homeless shelters and out on the street during the night, I see homeless people, but I see them with Christ, he's there, he's there with them, and sometimes I can find him clearer there than I can sitting in my chair here tonight. And so I hope tonight and every Good Friday can help us to really see that the cross says that Jesus is not over it, he's not just past it, he's not in heaven someday, but he's actually here with us in it. And it's very possible that many of us can't find God because we're not looking for him in it. Jesus was God being separated for us. Do you guys understand that? We see it all through the Bible, right? When our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, they had to leave, and the door was closed behind them. But God didn't send them off with nothing. He sent them off with a promise. You can't come home right now. This door is closed to you for a long time and all of your ancestors, but I promise you one day, someone will separate themselves for you separate themselves for you. And that's what happened to Jesus, right? Guys, think about this. We're too used to the Christian story. Jesus was the son of God, the king of the Jews, and when he came to them as their own promised Messiah and king, basically all of them rejected him, spit on him. He wasn't right for them. They turned him over to their enemies and had him killed. Only from being used to it are we have we grown numb to the fact that Jesus allowed himself to be separated for us? Jesus allowed himself to be separated even from his own identity as the king of kings. He wore that purple robe in mockery. He wore that crown of thorns. He was allowed himself to be enthroned on an instrument of death and torture. For us, he allowed himself to be separated for us, separated from others, separated from himself, and separated from God? No, I don't think so. You see, we 
were separated from God because we were guilty for what we have done. But because Jesus was God and voluntarily separated himself, then that day, death and sin tried to swallow a bite that was way too big for them. (laughs) That Jesus was the only one who could separate himself, come and get us, and then pick us all back up again and find our way home. You see, the Bible, my Bible says that death was swallowed up in victory. So that though Jesus may have tasted separation, he certainly didn't have to live in it. He only went in there to get you and me. And so I want us to remember tonight that God is here, is he not? Can you guys tell as we sing the old rugged cross that God is here, amen? Amen. And that would be awesome if we could gather together in buildings like this once to three times a week and know that God was with us. That's awesome. But there's more. Look at the cross and know that right now, as some guy is down the street drinking his rent money away, Jesus is sitting on the counter next to him hoping that one of these times he'll turn around and notice he doesn't have to be separated anymore. Even more challenging as we sit here mostly agreeing with one another. There are big groups of people who disagree with us politically and socially and in other ways. And some of them may even dislike and misunderstand and hate us. And do you know who's in their meetings with them? Hoping one day that they'll turn around and notice that they don't have to be alone anymore. Jesus is with them. Jesus is with us because of his cross. He bought his ticket to be able to sit with us and yet remain unstained by the world. I would like to read from Ephesians, and then I'd like to take communion together. So in Ephesians chapter two, we have these powerful words, and I hope you'll hear them together with me. Just listen tonight. In Ephesians chapter two, verse 11, it says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Does anybody here tonight remember? Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is Good Friday because of verse 13. Listen together with me. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. (laughs) For, listen, (laughs) what if it was just his blood? What if it was just some transaction? What if it wasn't he himself? How much less would our message be, amen? But my Bible goes on to say that for he himself is our peace. When you reach out to God, you don't just touch a book, you don't just touch a way of life, you don't just touch a picture, you don't just touch a future or a change of your mind or some kind of reform in your life, you don't just touch sobriety, you don't just touch being reunited with your family, you don't just touch eternity, you don't just touch forgiveness, you grab a hold of the nail-scarred hand of God himself and he's not far from you, he's in it with you. He himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh that law of commandments, abolishing that law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. We don't live in a time of peace, ladies and gentlemen. I've got five kids, I wish we did, don't you? Don't you wish we could be at peace in our world? But listen, we don't at this time. We don't live in a time of peace. And it's given us a pretty good opportunity though because we're living in a world full of people who are wondering where they could find God. And as for me and us here at Cross Point, I wanna repent of making people feel like they need to come over to us so they can find God. That's falling far short of the cross. And if I had had to get over anything to come and find God, I wouldn't be standing here right now. So I'm glad that God is here among us, but if we wanna make this a good Friday, then I want us to really see in the cross 
the fact that Jesus is with our neighbors, are we? Jesus is with the people who hate us, are we with them? Jesus was willing to be defamed, stripped, mocked, falsely accused, beaten, killed, so that he could show the fact that he was not separated from us, are we willing? I hope so. I wanna be. (laughs) I'm growing in it. I'm better now than I used to be. I love my neighbors more now than I used to be. I understand how unable I am to find God now more than I used to be. And it's all because of what I'm seeing in the cross. So when Ephesians chapter two tells us to remember, then I'm asking you, Cross Point, as we take communion together tonight, to remember.